Okay, this video is um, book reviews of the first book here is Catholic Literary Giants by Joseph Pierce. Second book is called Catholic Converts by Patrick Allett. And I preferred this uh, book by Pierce because it's very joyful and enthusiastic and whatnot versus Catholic Converts. It's good. I mean, Patrick Allett is good. The main spot you're going to hear of Patrick Allett is he teaches multiple courses at thegreatcourses.com. They're available in DVD, CD, and online and whatnot. And he's an Englishman. He's a good historian and he's a good guy, but he's a little bit boring, a little bit of a university formality about him, which I think, you know, detracts. Pierce is more of an enthusiastic uh, type guy, bright guy. I'm actually going to start with some quotes from Ayn Rand just because she kind of captures what am I trying to do with all these lectures. I'm trying to show people there's this beautiful, intelligent world out there that they don't ever get to know about most persons. And, you know, anytime you go into popular uh, social media, it just tends to be vulgar and degrading um, and dehumanizing and whatnot. So I'm sort of showing people some of the great stuff from the past and the history that they can decide for themselves if they enjoy it and they want to explore it more. Um, and I'm actually starting with quotes from Ayn Rand because... Ayn Rand was like the smartest woman who ever lived, and um, she said a lot of good things. This is from her book called The Romantic Manifesto about what is good in art, and here she, here she goes. I am a bridge between the aesthetic achievements of the 19th century and the minds who choose to discover them. It is impossible for the young people of today to grasp the reality of man's higher potential and what scale of achievement it had reached, but I have seen it. I know it was real, that it existed, that it was possible. It is that knowledge that I want to hold up to the sight of men over a brief span of less than a century before the barbarian curtain descends altogether, if it does. And the last memory of man's greatness vanishes into another dark ages. Ayn Rand, she lived from 1905 to 1982, and I see it just like her. There is so much good, fantastic stuff out there, but it never gets mentioned in school curriculums. It's never on TV. It's never in all the common social media type stuff. Um, so I'm basically, you know, for the person, this, this, my whole YouTube channel, that's kind of what it's about, to show you the good stuff that's out there. And so here's a little more for coming from Ayn Rand. Trust me, she's absolutely brilliant. And yeah, she's a little crazy, but all geniuses are a little crazy. There's a lot of good things about her. I know some people say she's a bitch and all this stuff. Yeah, maybe in some ways she did this or that, but she did so many good, brilliant things. Uh, I've actually read a lot of her books. Okay, here, here she goes, her next statement. It was Aristotle who said that fiction is of greater philosophical importance than history because history, history represents things only as they are while fiction represents them as they might be, as they ought to be. And the primary value of art is that it gives man the experience of living in a world where things are as they ought to be. This experience is of crucial importance to him. It is a psychological lifeline. Yeah, it's inspiring. It's like a mentor figure having that sense of what is possible. Ayn Rand continues, the distance between Victor Hugo's world and ours is astonishing, astonishingly short. He died in 1885, but the distance between his universe and ours has to be measured in aesthetic light years. He is virtually unknown to the American public, except for some vandalized remnants on our movie screens. His works are seldom discussed in the literary courses of our universities. He is invisible to the neo-barbarians of our age. That's good. To the neo-barbarians of our age. Modern readers, particularly the young, should be cautioned that a first encounter with Hugo might be shocking to them. It is like emerging from a murky underground filled with the moans of festering half-corpses into a blinding burst of sunlight. Yes, there definitely is better things out there. Okay, so now we're going to talk about these books. So this is the book Catholic Literary Giants, and uh, I'll keep this on a shelf. Uh, where I have all my books kind of filed on different shelves, but I have too many books. They, like I got a lot of them. I just have them all piled up. And so Catholic Converts, I kind of summarized my notes from it. Um, but this one I'll, I'll, I'll keep around more on a shelf that I might go back to more. Um, the greatest Catholic writer, by the way, is William Shakespeare. 
That's a long story, but Shakespeare was a Catholic. That's why hardly anybody knows anything about him because it was something that he didn't want to popularize at a time when Catholics weren't popular in England. Um, now, according to him, only in 2001, only 3% of Englanders went to church. And so English Anglican has kind of become a joke and England's sort of falling apart. Um, I've always thought of it as a joke. I mean, it was basically founded by Henry VIII uh, for his polygamy and so he could loot the Catholic Church. Um, and that's partly why it's so weak when it's founded by someone like him. Uh, when a nation turns its back on God, then God turns his back on them. So things don't look good for England. Um, for, and then here's a quote from Jacques Barzun in his book, you know, From Dawn to Decadence. He wrote, for Protestantism, Luther is like Marx and Calvin is like Lenin. Okay, it's a little harsh, but um, anyways, you know, like I said, I'm Irish, so half Irish and, you know, they call it uh, pulling the lion's tail, you know, just making fun of England. All right, America is not far behind with its declining interest in religion. I actually like a lot of English people and a lot of culture from England, but I do like to joke about them. Okay, America is not far behind with its declining interest in religion. The current Catholic Pope is so bad, you'd think he was an Anglican. Okay, Allet's book emphasizes conversions to Catholicism in England, especially from Cardinal John Henry Newman onwards. Okay, I'm going to get into a lot of good stuff. This is just a little background filler here. Pierce's book emphasizes the intellectual development of the best Catholic writers, especially from 1800s onwards. Allet's book is more formal, a scholarly product, something like an elective class in college. It's good, but it's a little reserved compared to Pierce's book. Um... Let's see, in 2001, according to Allet, about 50% of Americans went to church. That sounds like a little bit too high a figure for me. Uh, but Evelyn Waugh says, the world has a choice between Christianity and chaos. Europe came into being through Christianity. Without Christianity, Europe has no significance and no power to command allegiance. Okay, um, Catholic literary giants. Pierce spends a lot of time on the Inklings. You know the story of the Inklings. That's uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien and Owen Barfield, etc. And there's some other ones in there too. They were good. Okay, tradition requires conformity, but conversion requires a rejection of one's past, so it requires nonconformity. Okay, some of the most famous Christian Mostly Catholic converts were, of course, St. Paul saw the light on the road to Damascus. St. Anthony, you know, had his vision that he should follow and take on the aesthetic life. St. Jerome, you know, are you a Ciceronian or a Christian? Um, the Tola Legge, Tola Legge, pick up and read story of St. Augustine. So this is a lot of stuff you would get, like, from Allet's book, some of this historical stuff. Pascal's Conversion, Pascal's Wager. Okay, so now we're getting to the more interesting stuff. Cardinal John Henry Newman in 1845 he was the big proponent of the Oxford Tractarian movement, basically a resurgence of Catholicism within England, which was predominantly Protestant, of course. Um, and this overlapped with several other big movements. There was the Gothic Revival movement in architecture of Augustus Welby Pugin. He was a magnificent architect who looked at the Catholic cathedrals and said, they're so much better than the Protestant boring churches. Um, and also, as far as back to tradition movement, there was John Ruskin, which is a little bit of a social movement, and the literature of that was largely Charles Dickens. Um, and so Ruskin is funny, though, because if you know the guy, if you know anything about him, he's very funny. I made a video about him before because he's really sort of a Scottish-English Protestant who can't help falling in love with all the Catholic art and Catholic cathedrals. Um, and he's the one that sponsored the artists, the young uh, pre-Raphaelites like Millet and the other ones. There were the best artists ever in the history of England for painting. Um, Ruskin, just a typical thing Ruskin would do. He spent months living with the monks and the Franciscans in Assisi. Um, John Ruskin's an interesting person. If you're curious about history uh, in, in England in the Victorian age, John Ruskin, you'll find him fascinating. Okay, um, John Henry Newman, here's the things he'll say. If you read history, you become a Catholic. You can follow the history of Catholicism all the way back to Christ. He found, Christ founded the, the church in 33 AD. And the Bible was con not consolidated until later, not until 393 AD. Newman said that the Roman Catholic Church was the middle way between Anglican, which was controlled by a secular ruler and therefore lost its credibility, and Puritanism, which was sort of crazy, you know, the, the outshoot of uh, Luther and then Henry VIII. Uh, well, of Luther. Okay, the Catholic converts tended to view the Reformation as a disaster that had broken up Christendom. Some believed that only Christianity in general, 
particularly by unification in Catholicism, or just unification in general, had the potential to save the world from atheistic serfdom and slavery. And there's a lot of people who still think that. And regardless of what the individual wants, the individual can do whatever they want. But it, it does seem to be the case that serfdom is really coming back big, unfortunately. Um, the reunification of Christianity and Catholicism is a quixotic quest. The current pope is so bad that he's basically a hopeless individual. Um, the non-denominational preachers like Billy Graham are much more charismatic. You'd be surprised how uh, charismatic Billy Graham is. You know, you listen to him. He doesn't speak with a whole lot of 2 plus 2 equals 4 type facts, but he says so many things that are, are positive and put you in a good mood. It's rather surprising. Okay, uh, getting back to Pierce and, and uh, Allet. Okay, now here's, here's John Henry Newman, a quote from him. John Henry Newman, 1849. If you turn away from Catholicism, to whom will you go? It is your only chance of peace and assurance in this turbulent, changing world. In the long run, it will be found that either the Catholic religion is verily, and indeed, the coming in of the unseen world into this, or that there is no real, there is nothing real in any of our notions as to whence we come and whither we are going. Unlearn Catholicism and you become Protestant. Then Unitarian, Deist, Pantheist, Skeptic, in a dreadful but infallible succession. John Henry Newman, 1849. Joseph Pierce describing Newman, Newman's pyrotechnic profundity. Your choice, authentic tradition or the abyss of nihilism. You know, a lot of people are too stupid to realize the abyss of nihilism, but an intelligent person gets it. It's not good. Okay, there are a lot of reasons to prefer Catholicism over Protestantism. But, okay, so great things about Protestantism. Of course, there's the music of Bach. There's the books of Charles Dickens in the mid-1800s. Um, Catholicism's got better cathedrals, better paintings, better statues, better connection to the origins of Christianity. And Catholic, Catholics don't tend to take rules very seriously. I, I mean, like myself, I don't care too much about specifics of doctrine. Um, I went to a Catholic school for eighth grade. And the teacher's moral standards were basically like the same as my parents. Um, you know, in the entire year in eighth grade at a Catholic school, there was no fights, not a single fight. There was no one having sex. I would have known. There was no drugs. I never felt pressured to do anything at a Catholic school. People say, well, how could you stand being a religious school? I never was pressurized to do anything. And then I said, in comparison with the public schools, like I saw in seventh grade, in seventh grade, kids were having sex at a public school. Kids were having sex. Lots of kids were on drugs. There were lots of fights. Um, there was lots of bad behavior. There was very little supervision. The halls were just sort of like no man's zone. Um, the adults were not in charge, did not want to be in charge. Um, the best school a person could go to is homeschool. I mean, that's where kids learn the fastest, learn the most. And a lot of the best academic performers and geniuses were largely homeschooled or at least spent a long time alone or had a parent that spent a lot of time trying to teach him. Um, in Christianity, great music comes from all over the place. And that's no specific denomination. Um, the reason secular rulers hate Christianity is because it empowers the people. It's the religion of slaves and peasants. Secular rulers want the people divided, hopeless, easy to control. Um, Christianity has remained unified for thousands of years. It, Catholicism and Christianity hold a civilization together. Without it, a society tends to descend into barbarism. Okay, uh, a lot of things that just come up in these two books. You know, T.S. Eliot was way more Catholic than is widely known. He sort of, you know, promoted in this in the kids like high school literature textbooks as being anti. Christian, but he's actually very Catholic. Okay? He was not thrilled with the uh, lost generation um, dissolution, you know, after the First World War. Okay, and then the schools will teach you about crazy people like Virginia Woolf. You know, she was just constantly trying to kill herself, and finally she did. I mean, that's kind of crazy. A person with a good worldview, they don't want to do that to themselves. They might have an episode of depression or something, but that was a repeated issue with her. She was nuts, okay? And that's the kind of one who gets taught to the kids. And then a heroic man like Roy Campbell, who was actually in Spain during their Civil War, uh, he doesn't get taught to the students. Um, he saw the communists burn down all the churches, shoot all the priests and the monks. Um, that was real life experience. He was out there trying to help them. Okay, the origin of veganism reminds me of Christianity. I was going to make some jokes. You know, it's an outsider movement. Um, the universities promote the joke of a Mediterranean diet. 
Okay, almost all the experts come from outside the mainstream. I'll, I'll let you read those if you want, but getting back to the other stuff from the book. Um, the Roman Catholic Church has stayed in existence for you know over 2,000 years, whereas the Protestant churches, they're constantly breaking up into different little splinter groups. Um, they don't have that staying power like the Catholic Church does. Um, the, this guy, Pierce, he loves Tolkien. He, you know, The Lord of the Rings is the best-selling book of the whole 1900s, and this book analyzes the whole thing, all the theory, all the allegory, and all that kind of stuff, and you know, which is nice. And I like J.R. Tolkien, but I thought the Chronicles of Narnia type stuff coming out of C.S. Lewis were more entertaining. Uh, I did watch the entire movie, all the hours of it, and I thought it was good, but it's not that philosophic for my interest. Um, Tolkien said, you know, God has created, God created man in his image, so God is a creator, so man can be a creator. Um, Pierce summary of them. Newman, Chesterton, and, and Tolkien were all anchored in the philosophy of Aristotle and Aquinas. Like Ayn Rand said, Aristotle sort of valued man's intellect. Very much the opposite of people like, um, you know, Immanuel Kant, who sort of just tried to discredit man's intellect and leads to stupidity. Uh, oh, the big line from the from the from the movie, "One ring to rule them all." So I say the cell phone ringtone is what rules people, it makes people stupid. I'm not a fan of cell phones. I think as soon as somebody gets a cell phone for their kid, their IQ drops at least 10 points. You know, all they want to do is uh, you know send a text message to their friend. They become real stupid, and then you want to sleep by it. You got to watch your kid and get that away from them. They'll sleep with it next to their head. They don't know any better. Okay, um, some other things from these books here. Oh, Oscar Wilde was much more Catholic than is widely known. He couldn't have officially early on convert because his father would have disowned him, but he wrote a lot of stories, the very uh, Christian uh, angle to him, like his uh, fairy tales that he wrote, like The Giant, for example. Um, here's just a quick summary of some of the prominent Christian writers through history. Of course, 1300s, Dante. Uh, after that, all the King Arthur and its variants and chivalry stories, 1600s, Don Quixote, Hamlet, 1700s, Tristram Shandy. That's a crazy book, an autobiography written about what happened before he was born. Um, 1800s, then uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman and the tra Oxford Tractarian Movement was very big. Charles Dickens was the greatest writer uh, of prose in the English language um, in the 1800s by far. Um, Dostoevsky, probably the best overall novelist. Ayn Rand says it's Victor Hugo. Maybe, I think it's Dostoevsky, but they're both magnificent. Also, Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi is a magnificent book. It's more than good. It's great, and it's not just for kids. That's an absolute masterpiece. Um, you, 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 there's a very good reason why Italian people just love Pinocchio. To, to, the more you know it, the more you like it. Uh, G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc, we talked about them. I gave a previous video about them. T.S. Eliot and Evelyn Waugh, not as exciting, but good, solid. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis, I found him quite entertaining. I mean, I disagree with plenty of things with C.S. Lewis, but I enjoyed his Chronicles of Narnia, and I enjoyed his Mere Christianity book, and some of his other stuff, too. is is good, not quite as good as those two, but good. Tolkien, you know, Tolkien was just obsessed with sort of ancient history, all these Norse traditions and early versions of English and all that. So, and he's very meticulous about his whole Middle Earth creation, and it's totally an allegory of the Bible and of some other uh, stories. So, that's what he said. His number one influence on Lord of the Rings was, he said, his, his Catholic religion. Um, 1960s, 1980s, sort of the big writers in the Christian tradition were Solzhenitsyn and, and Pasternak, like Boris Shavago, Gula Archipelago. Um, some other more recent uh, great writers of the same bent were Thomas Wolfe, like uh, The Kingdom of Speech is a great book. Dan Brown wrote Da Vinci Code, which is really, you know, anti-Christian, but is still so well written and entertaining. And it's full of lies and misinformation. But it's it's very interesting, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code book. And you 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 learn something from trying to refute it. It's 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 fun, entertaining book. And I read it in a couple of languages and I enjoyed it. And I noticed a lot of people I had conversations, a lot of books I try to talk to them, they won't have read them. Lots of people that read it will have read Da Vinci Code. Um, Eric Metaxas, he's probably the best of the Christian writers that are out there today. He's written a lot of good stuff. Wow, and is that it? Well, I guess that's all I got. Let's see, I think so. Let's see, no, I got anything else? Yep, that's it for the slide. So, anyways, just to give you a sense of those books, if you're interested in those topics, there's some of the stuff, and just the sense that there was a lot of these really good people who knew a lot and shared a lot and wrote a lot. 
that if you're interested in reading, it's all out there.